Okay, today we'll be talking about uh, herbicide resistance and how we can kind of manage that a little bit. Um, and just quantifying what the, the actual threat is to, to herbicide resistance in the province based on some surveys that have been done. First off, we'll, do, we'll just kind of clarify the difference between herbicide tolerance and herbicide resistance. Essentially, it boils down to if it always was tolerant, it's tolerance. If it used to be controlled and it isn't any longer, that's resistance. So that's how you distinguish between the two. So something like wild buckwheat is somewhat tolerant to glyphosate. Um, but kochia is resistant because it was easily controlled by glyphosate, but now it isn't. So the basic concept of the way that a herbicide works is on enzymes in the plant. And essentially an enzyme in the plant is just it's a catalyst. It's a biological catalyst that allows a reaction to take place in the plant way faster than what it would in, uh, in say, a jar by itself. And essentially that green thing that was whizzing off to the right-hand side, that's an essential component for growth. And those things that were coming in were subcomponents to create that thing. It can also go in the opposite direction where you have the green thing going into the enzyme site and then having two things split off as it detoxifies various different uh, compounds in the plant. So if we look at how a herbicide works, it goes into that site and it locks into that site irreversibly. So it has a much higher affinity for that, that site in the plant than the components that go in there. And as a result, that essential component for growth won't be produced. And so that's all, all the groups on the right-hand side, those are all essential component for growth restriction type activities as far as herbicides go. The other thing that happens is that one of those components that can back up behind that target site as well. And so what happens is that you've got another system upstream that's pushing a component into that target site and it might be toxic and it has to bind to another thing to make it not toxic. And so if that thing doesn't get bound to that other component, then we end up with that backing up inside the cell and it becomes toxic to the membranes. And typically those are membrane disruptor products. And those are all listed on the left-hand side. One thing you will notice is that group 10 or Liberty ends up on both sides. And that's because it, that a consequence of the reaction where you've got the inhibition of glutamine by Liberty, there's a backup of ammonia in the cell as well. So both of those things are going on at the same time. And so you can get each of those reflected in different circumstances depending on the situation. So sometimes you'll th see a plant where it's been completely desiccated and other times you'll see a plant that has a lot of white on it. So it's, it's an interesting uh, concept in that regard. So with resistance what we get is a mutation to that target site or to some, in some proteins that are very closely associated with that enzyme site. And as a result it blocks that herbicide from going into that target site and, per, and then those other components are allowed to go in there and then come off and the essential components are produced. The material doesn't back up behind the, that target site and in the meantime, the herbicide breaks down and goes away. There are other mechanisms that we find particularly in glyphosate resistance uh, that are considered to be uh, multi-gene non-target site type of resistance, whereas the normal resistance that we see here in the prairies is a result of a single mutation, it makes it so that that herbicide can't fit into that slot. Kochia does things a little bit differently in that a normal susceptible kochia will have one copy of the EPSPS gene um, that is the target site for glyphosate. And so you end up with a certain amount of that uh, protein being produced, your glyphosate goes in the plant at a higher level than the protein is there, and you have excess glyphosate and the plant dies. What happens with a resistant biotype is you get a buildup of those genes on, at different points within that, uh, that genetic system, and as that thing kind of goes through its normal replication process, it keeps producing more and more of that uh, EPSPS uh, enzyme. And as a result, when you add your glyphosate that you would have before at the normal rate, it ties up all the glyphosate. And there's lots of that enzyme left over for the plant to function quite normally. So that's the way that you get to resistant kochia developing. Um, this same type of system gets used in 
um, species from the U.S. like Palmer amaranth and, and water hemp where they overproduce that, that enzyme as well. So the same type of uh, process gets used in several different species. Other ways that you get resistance to glyphosate, and glyphosate's kind of a weird one because it's really hard to get a single gene mutation that results in resistance and a viable plant. Typically, if you get a mutation to that EPSPS target site, your plant tends not to thrive very well. And so some of the first resistance that they saw was like that. If you get two mutations happening at the same time, which is very, very rare and unlikely, then yes, you may get um, complete resistance and decent tolerance. You can also get reduced uptake and translocation of the, uh, the glyphosate itself. So it doesn't penetrate the cuticle, and once it gets into the cell, it doesn't get trans translocated very actively within the plant. Um, there's another interesting process that they found in some plants where as soon as that, that glyphosate gets applied, the plant recognizes that as a threat. And there's this concept called sudden death syndrome that allows a plant to defend itself from diseases normally. So if a disease infects that, that plant leaf, it kills that leaf right away and the leaf drops off and, and the disease is gone. So it does the same thing with glyphosate, and so when you get glyphosate in the plant, the leaf dies right away, leaves all drop off, and as a result, you have the plant growing back from lateral buds or um, other roots. And so if it's an annual plant and we're applying at the proper time at a, at a smaller stage, that's not so big a deal because it kind of just acts like a contact herbicide. But in the corn growing regions, what they'll do is they'll let their weeds get to be about that tall before they end up controlling them. And then this kind of process kicks in. Another system is vacuole sequestration. And to understand what a vacuole is, is that just imagine we've got a circle here and then inside that circle, we've got another, another container. And essentially a vacuole is just the garbage can of the cell. So all the junk goes in there that the cell doesn't want and it gets isolated from the rest of the cell so it's not toxic to the cell. On the outside of uh, cells in a plant, there's a thing called an ion pump. And that ion pump helps move glyphosate across that membrane and in, into the cell. So what the plant does is it transfers that type of mechanism from the outside membrane to the membrane of the vacuole. So as soon as it translocates that material into the cell, it pumps it into the vacuole right away it's isolated and the cell doesn't die. So it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, process. The one challenge with that is that if we happen to get a plant with that kind of mechanism, it will also be immediately resistant to glufosinate or Liberty. And so we'll end up, if it happens to occur in a canola field, we've now lost about 95% of our herbicide tolerance options in canola as a result of that type of, uh, that type of change. So we have that one mutant in the field, so what happens that it gets to be a problem? Because one small mutant plant that survives is not gonna be an economic issue. So what we end up with is we've got our one plant that will survive our application. That plant ends up uh, continuing its life cycle and producing seed and dropping seed, and way more than four seeds like we've got here. And those four seeds go through into the next year and then they end up germinating along with all the other plants and so Again, it's really hard to see because it's not really a lot of plants. They'll come up, you'll get sprayed again, and you'll end up with all the plants dying except for the progeny of that one plant. So it only takes one plant to actually start a resistance problem, and that can be either from uh, mutation or something being imported to your field. So don't count on glyphosate coming from somewhere else necessarily. It could be in your field right now, and we'll get to that and we'll kind of look at that. So let's imagine we've got a plant with a natural mutation rate of one in a million. And I know that sounds like a really big number. Um, essentially, we, you can go along for several applications and you get very, very good control. And then maybe in the one year you end up with a little bit and you go, something's kind of fishy here, but I'll just kind of live with it and see what happens. But then the following year, you end up with a really big control failure. And I'll illustrate that in kind of a visual format here in a bit. Um, but looking at a one in a million mutation rate, if you look at a relatively modest 
weed infestation of about 40 plants per square meter, that equals 24 million plants per quarter section. So you have the potential in every quarter section for there to be 24 mutants that have herbicide resistance. So that's not as big a number as we think, and if you take that to one in a, one in a billion, just add a few more zeros to that, and so you might end up with 13 per farm, say a 5,000 acre farm. So it's not as rare as we think, and if we got a really heavy weed population of 400 plants per square meter, now we're looking at 240 plants per quarter section. So it's really not that hard to start getting selection occurring right within your own field um, if we're not actively managing herbicide resistance on an ongoing basis. And this is kind of a chart-wise uh, visualization of what's happening. So what, this, is, this is kind of here to illustrate why we uh, at our crop protection lab don't really give out percentages. Uh, because they're a bit deceptive as to what's going on as far as resistance results and testing results for resistance. Um, we can percolate along here at very, very low levels and not really recognize that there's any resistance going on. You may get that little blip that we were talking about, and then right away the next year you've got a full-blown problem. And so if we get hung up on numbers between anywhere between 20% and 70%, we're just kind of kidding ourselves because the next year it's all going to be full blown in a way, regardless of what that number is. So precision in this number really isn't that important for determining whether you've got a problem or not. Registering a positive indicates you've got a problem that you need to address right away. So this is the great herbicide resistance spreader. Um, how many of you clean your combines regularly, aggress and very thoroughly going from field to field? I don't see any hands. So if you get one mutant and it starts producing those few odd plants and you're not cleaning your combine out as you go to the next field, guess what happens? The resistance goes there with you because it's always hanging out inside of a combine, always. And so I talked about that visual representation of that one in a million and as it spreads. So there's our one in a million number. It, there's a thousand dots in this field. And that, let's say that represents our, our weeds across the field in groups of what, 10 or 100 or something. So if you've got one in a million, you can't really see it in your field. You go to one in 100,000, you can't see it. You go to one in 10,000, you can't really see it but you get to that point where you're at now, you've got about a third of a percent of your population that's resistant. You might start to see some plants pop up here and there and think, well, something's kind of up. We'll see how it goes. Then the next year, what you'll end up with is a consolidated patch where you saw those plants the previous year, but then there'll be other outliers all outside of that patch. So there'll be the odd plant here and there all over the place. And how did they get there? the great resistance spreader. Your combine blew those all over hell and high water, so to speak, right? Then the next year, that's what happens. So you've got that consolidated patch has now spread to be bigger, and those little ones that were all satellites on the outside have all congealed into one great big patch in the middle. And what you may also see is there's your big patch in the middle, You've got now those, some of those little satellite populations that were way outside that main population. They've started producing their own satellite patches. You may have lines that go in and out of that larger patch that shows the path of the combine in and out of those, that infested area. You may end up, so that arrow is your entrance to the field. If you brought it from somewhere else, you may see it show up starting at that gate and going whatever direction you go with the combine. And that may be where your patch shows up first. Or you may see it running with a water run through the field. So those are different patterns you'll see in the field when you have something like resistance going on, or a new weed for that matter. So how do we tell the difference between an application miss and resistance in the field? Application misses will typically be very geometrical. They'll be very straight lines. They'll be very defined boundaries. 
and resistance patches will be very diffuse and so you won't have any real solid boundaries but you'll see some pattern where it's kind of moved with the equipment through the field and you'll see a kind of a general pattern that way but nothing really sharp boundaried. The other thing to look for is that if you've got multiple resistance in that miss, then that's likely a miss with the sprayer. But if you've got one species that isn't being controlled and all the other ones are being controlled, it's a good chance that's resistance because it's very unlikely you're gonna get multiple species develop resistance to a herbicide at exactly the same time. So those are the things to look for in the field. Here's an example of a resistance patch in Australia of rigid ryegrass and the Australians are really um, quite experienced with resistance. So there's our main patch there, and so this would be the year before the full-blown problem. But we've got our main patch, but notice all these little satellite patches here, there, there, out there, way over there, way over there, way, way back in there, over here. So that's what I mean by you've got all those little individual plants all popping up all over the place and forming their own little patches. And with kochia, it's got its own mobility system, so you'll see it running in lines. If you've got a line in your field, don't try and wait to deal with it. If you see something like that showing up in your fallow field, get in there with a mower and a cultivator and knock that stuff down and get rid of it right away. Otherwise, you're gonna have a full-blown problem in no time at all. So resistance across the world has been increasing pretty linearly since about the early 80s. And it's continued to do that year and year and year and year over year. What about Canada? We're following the same general pattern as the world is. And then if we look at Saskatchewan, these are the last three weed surveys that we've got in the province. And this is essentially fields with at least one case of herbicide resistance. And that's only group one and group two. That doesn't include all the other groups that are out there as well. So we're following a linear path as well. So we're not really different than the world. If we want to predict what's going to happen in, in the survey that's going on right now in 19 and 20, it's a good bet that we'll see upwards of 80% of fields will have at least one case of herbicide resistance. So everybody's going to be impacted by this pretty darn shortly. So as far as glyphosate resistance goes, this is, these are plots of um, essentially resistant biotypes that are showing up across the world. And what I've done is I've labeled all the species that we have here in Saskatchewan. All those black letters are all weeds that we have here in Saskatchewan. And so we know that we do have kochia that's resistant now in Saskatchewan. And notice how it wasn't very far behind when kochia developed elsewhere. And typically that's gonna be in the US. Ours was a unique source of resistance. It didn't come from somewhere else. It was bred here. So it, it's, it's not an import. We've also got all these other plants that are all over the place. Annual sow thistle, wild sunflower, prickly lettuce. We've got gobs of those things all over the place. So the chances are that we could be seeing resistance to those uh, as well. Uh, Australia is just reporting their first case of wild oat resistance. And it's not just one species of wild oats, it's two species of wild oats that it, it's, they're finding resistance to glyphosate. So it, it can happen here, so we need to be managing glyphosate resistance as well. The other thing that we've got on the horizon is these two critters, and you guys are probably right on the front line for that, um, is Palmer amaranth and, and tall water hemp. There's water hemp right on the border uh, between the Saskatchewan and the Manitoba boundary just to the south of North Dakota. So it can happen here. It does like wet areas, so from that perspective, the Assiniboine area is probably a little bit protected, but proximity to the U.S. and length of growing season is not working on your side either. It's a warm season plant, likes uh, really hot conditions, does really well in dry conditions as well. Um, so it could persist here quite easily. Palmer amaranth, I don't see really on the horizon for another five years or so, but it's also on its way north. It started out in Arizona, it's now into North Dakota. 
counties in the southern counties in North Dakota right now. So those two things come pre-packed with resistance, and not just glyphosate resistance, but glyphosate, group 2, group 4, group 14, group 5. So they have all of those, and they'll come pre-loaded with all those resistance biotypes. So we need to keep our eye out for those as well. Here's the rankings of resistance in the world. And just like the Olympics, we get, we get the bronze. Yay! Um, but you can see we're, we're kind of up there with the heavy hitters. Uh, even some of the countries in, in Europe are not, as, uh, not having as big a problem with resistance as we are. If you take Europe as a whole, then yeah, they're, they're more than us. But um, the U.S. has a really super diverse agricultural profile. They've got almonds and tree fruits and cotton and vegetables and all manner of things that have the potential to uh, create resistance. We've got a really narrow, narrow little strip of land right on this, the 49th parallel and into Ontario. So compare what we're doing to what the US is doing in Australia as a whole continent, essentially. We're punching way above our weight as far as resistance goes. So we've got to kind of get on top of this before it gets away from us too bad. And there's the, the European line right there. So if you take Europe as a conglomerate, then yeah, they're about the same as the US. And again, they have a really diverse agriculture, lots of crops, lots of different, um, lots of different uh, things going on. Use of a much broader group of herbicide uh, groups as well, and that accounts for that higher level of resistance as well. Um, one of the bigger concerns is weeds that have resistance to more than one group. So we've got, let's say we've got wild oats that are resistant to group one and group two. So that would be the two line on there. Or we've got kochia that's resistant to group four, group nine, and group, uh, group two. That's the next line down, so that's the three. And so we've got an increasing amount of weeds that are being resistant to multiple different groups. And so the water hemp's are down here on these bottom lines where they're resistant to everything. And so some of those are in Australia. This is across the world as well. Um, we would think that we wouldn't have any that would fit into that, that larger category down here on the bottom, like any of these down here. But we've got wild oats that are resistant to group one, group two, group eight, group 15, and group 25. Group 25 isn't sold anymore, but we do, back when it was being sold, we had populations that were resistant to that as well. So we have had four-way resistance for sure. We've got a population in Manitoba that's being reported as being resistant to group one, two, eight, 14 and 15, but 14 is not really fair because it doesn't really control wild oats all that well on its own. So does it really count? Eh, probably not. So I'll, I'll give that one a, a pass. So we saw this chart before and where it's heading. Um, again, just continuing on some of those survey results. Um, and there is, like I say, there is a survey that has gone on in part of the province this year. We'll finish off next year. And then those results, they'll be screening those over the next couple of years. So the results probably won't be out until 2022, something like that, from that survey. But these are the last three surveys that we've had uh, in the province. And what the level of resistance from a percentage basis is in those samples that were collected from those fields. And we can see that group one is on a linear path upward. And I would be inclined to predict that there'll be 70% of fields that have a group one in them by this year. Group two, we'll kind of give that a break because we really didn't have a whole lot of, um, a large number of group two options that span the full rotation, let's put it that way, uh, until into about the mid 2000s. So when we look at 2009, that's probably our first reference point for resistance but we're probably looking at about 40% group two, 
And then if we look at combined options, that doesn't fall along very far behind the group two line. So we're looking at maybe about 30% that have a two-way mix, wild oats, and uh, group one, group two mix. Group eight, they didn't assess in 2014-15. Don't ask me why, but they didn't do it. So we don't know what that number is. It could be 10%, it could be 30%. We don't know until somebody does the test. So they're trying to catch up on some of that now um, and then we'll figure out where that sits and then where does a three-way resistance go from there, right? Other things that came out of that survey, 15% um, of all fields that were uh, green foxtail was collected, which was 40 per, 44%, or 15% of fields had group one resistant green foxtail. That was 44% of the samples that were tested. Um, in Manitoba, has the same thing. 21% uh, of all fields have group two resistant green foxtail. And the group two is a little bit unique in the sense that the group one is that single target site mutation. The group two, they figure it's metabolic. So when you have metabolic resistance or multi-gene resistance, now what you're looking at is something that um, will very easily jump from one group to the next and be able to break down all the herbicides. So that one's kind of a scary uh, result. Also, we've got six broadleaf plants that developed resistance or showed resistance, and a few of them for the first time in the surveys. But we're looking at a fifth of samples that were taken to a quarter, somewhere in there. So let's look at your options for controlling wild oats in wheat. So these are all the products that are registered for control of wheat and their active ingredients. I didn't put in any of the box mixes, and if I did that, then that would multiply that number by a substantial amount, especially in the top group, top and the two top groups. So if we get group one and group two resistance, that's what you have available to you. So now you're down to the soil active products. You got nothing post-emergent. And because they didn't do that testing in that survey in 1415, we don't know where that is and whether there's multiple resistance there. So if you have multiple resistance there, that's all you got left. And oh, by the way, if you grow Durham, you can't use that. So now you got nothing to control wild oats and Durham. So that means you got to deal with those things some other way. And so we're look, we'll look at some of those options a little bit later on. Kosher resistance surveys, 300 samples were taken from a range of sites across Alberta. Uh, 40 per samples were glyphosate resistant by themselves. 8% of samples by themselves were dicamba resistant. And then there were 10% of samples that were resistant to both of them. So you're looking at 50% resistance to glyphosate and about 18 to dicamba, and then you've got the overlap in between. In Manitoba, they found about 59% resistance. So where do you think we sit? We're probably in the rough, rough area of that as well. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, we should see a full report on the Manitoba survey here in the coming months. Um, Saskatchewan surveys took place this, this fall. We'll probably see a report on that 20, early 2022, something like that. You're headed towards a wall. Are you gonna pump the brakes? Are you gonna turn away? What are you gonna do? So let's look at some options for managing that stuff. When, we, when producers are surveyed about what they're doing to manage resistance, what are they doing? We're using herbicides to manage herbicide resistance. And oh, by the way, we're rotating crops so that we can use different herbicides. Not for the diversity of the crops, we're just doing it so we can use different herbicides. So we're trying to manage herbicide resistance with herbicides. And so, whoop, you're caught on the herbicide resistance treadmill. So you're jumping from one group to the next group to the next group to the next group and causing each of those to fail 
until you've got nothing left. So that's the herbicide resistance treadmill. So don't get stuck on that. We've got a finite number of pathways that we can control plants through the use of herbicides. So we've got to look at some other methods to control herbicides. This is kind of the development that's gone on in herbicide development over the, the investment has stayed relatively level and we've had next to nothing coming out the other end. Everybody's all a flutter now that Bayer has announced that they've got a new active ingredient for broad acre crops. Ooh, it's only one active ingredient, folks. It's not going to save the world. Um, and they're looking at, it's not going to be here tomorrow. It's going to be here 10 years from now. If it makes it through the regulatory infrastructure, and they're also at the same time, they're looking at um, doing genetic engineering on crops to allow the, the crops to tolerate this thing. So it's obviously non-selective. Um, so what crops are they gonna work on first? They're gonna work on corn. They're gonna work on soybean. They're gonna work on rice. They're gonna work on cotton. Maybe canola, because they've already done it. Is it going to be wheat? I don't think so. Unlikely. Um, so you're still kind of swimming around in a pool of mud. Um, and using the other group one, like clethodim, that's not a long-term option. So you want to, if you have group one resistance, but you still have activity in clethodim, hold on to that thing like a rare gem. Don't overuse it and lose that one too. You want to save that one for special circumstances. Um, and jumping from the frying pan into the fire with group twos is not really going to be a long-term solution either. Uh, we've got three-way resistance uh, in kosher. Um, we've got lots of uh, plants that are resistant to group two herbicides and we're getting more and more every day. And so those ones are going to, on some major weeds too, by the way, once a weed is resistant, you can't reverse that because there's very little penalty to that plant for having resistance. So once it's got it, it hangs on to it. And if it's, even if it's one of those things that the plant loses a little bit of vigor, even if you were to never work that field again, you were to put it into pasture and just leave it, that population wouldn't revert back to a natural population for at least 100 or 200 years if you did have some reduction in vigor of that resistant biotype. So that's not going to be something you can hang your hat on either. A low level of resistance is not a bad thing. That's natural. But it's the way you manage that to maintain it at a low level is the real key. So strategies to manage herbicide resistance. I do another presentation for another group of producers and I'll unveil this at the end. You can probably guess it as we go through, but we'll look at different methodologies for managing weeds uh, before the herbicide goes into the field. I'm not saying you need to eliminate your herbicide, but use other strategies. Don't just rely totally on the herbicide. Prevention is the easiest thing to do. We talked about our combines. Spend 15 or 20 minutes blowing the back end of your combine out, blowing off your combine with compressed air. Can clean it out outside and inside. Make sure you're not moving this stuff around um, so that if you do get one field that gets a problem, you're not moving it to the other fields right away. Start with clean seed, either buy seed from a certified seed grower or have, it, have your own seed clean to that specification so that you're not collecting seed in one place and planting it in another place. Um, we talked about that. Uh, early detection rapid response, that's a new buzzword that's around for invasive plants and essentially resistant plants are kind of invasive in that sense. So you wanna um, catch these things immediately so you wanna be like just watching like a hawk for anything that gets missed and if it gets missed, if you see something that's odd, 
Don't just drive by it and deal with it another day. Stop, get out, pull the thing out. Don't let it go. Don't let it produce seed. Uh, manure should be um, composted. If it gets to 60 or 70 degrees for a few days, 98% of the weed seed in there is dead. So that's a very effective way. And uh, liquid manure pits, very few of the seeds make it, make it through liquid manure either. Make sure your field boundaries are clean. So if you've got like a saline patch that there's kochia in and you're going around that patch, deal with that somehow. Don't just leave it there because that's how that resistant kochia gets, um, gets developed is that because you're going around that patch with the sprayer, you're getting a, a sublethal dose blowing into that area. And so now you're selecting for the ones that have two of those genes and they cross with the brethren that have two of those genes and they're in different places. So now you have ones that have four of those genes and so it keeps going on and on and on till that population can move out into the field and infest those other areas and tolerate your full rate of herbicide. So deal with those boundary areas or low areas that aren't being cropped, put them into competitive forage, competitive forage grass and just leave them. Resist the, the resist the temptation to, to till them up, especially on years like our past few years where it's been really dry and those are the places that have moisture. If you've got saline patches, don't try and farm them because you're probably not getting an, any enough yield out of those to warrant the cost that you're putting in there. And if you're fertilizing through those patches and not getting the yield out, you're making them saltier because fertilizer is salt. Okay, so rotation should be well planned. Four years is probably a good starting point. If you really want to be a pro, you're going beyond that and planning out six, eight years, stuff like that. Should be a mix of competitive and non-competitive crops. So competitive crops like rye, winter wheat, barley, things like that. Um, I would argue that some of our um, hybrid canola is probably very competitive now as well. Uh, and comparable to some of those other crops. Um, plant them fairly heavy so that you get very quick early season canopy closure and then you're competing against those ones that get away so they don't survive and produce seed or they produce fewer seed at the end of the day. Every once in a while, plant a perennial forage crop, let it go through three or four years, then work it under and start over again and cover crops and intercrops are an option as well. So this is the impact of forages in, in your rotation. Uh, this was a study where the, there was paired fields and so we had field, one field on one side that had alfalfa or alfalfa grass hay in it for three years and the one beside it was continuous cereals. And so both of them had the same crop side by side in the, the year that they were assessed and so essentially you can see that all these things have all dropped quite substantially and it's as good as a herbicide. And what you're doing is you're taking out the seed bank, which is your enemy as far as resistance goes, not just a single year control. This is drawing down everything in the soil mm -hmm. as well. And the only one that really increased was dandelion. And that's probably not a surprise. So this is what we're looking at for things like kochia and Russian thistle for seed bank in the soil. By three years, you should be able to keep most of them down to next to nothing. So they're not hard to get rid of if you put a concerted effort in and get rid of those individuals that are kicking around afterwards. Wild oat. How long does everybody think that wild oat lasts in the soil? Any guesses? Throw them out. 25? 20? Okay, what we're doing is we're going from shallow to deep in this progression. So the color is down at the bottom. So we go from less than two inches, two inches to eight inches essentially, and then deeper than eight inches. So for the first year, you've got a quite a bit. It drops very substantially after the first year. 
especially if it's in that two to eight inch range. At the, the less than two inch range, if it's sitting on the surface, it's very susceptible to things like birds and mice and uh, crab and beetles that Chris Wollenberg is working on at the UMS, um, decay from diseases, things like that. You get really, really high mortality of those seeds when they sit on the surface. So leave them there. And then deeper down here. So year seven, how many we got left? Next to none. So everybody assumes that they last a long, long time, but the vast majority of your seeds are gone within three or four years. Total life, there's been estimates of in things that are less than heavy clay, five years for wild oats. Really heavy clays, you're looking at nine years maybe. And that's because it's, it's essentially a storage refrigerator. You have those seeds sitting in that heavy clay soil. It's like being in a refrigerator. So they're not as hard to get rid of as you think. You just have to be diligent about getting rid of them and not let anything survive. We did some work with uh, Indian Head um, Research Farm. Uh, we also did some work with um, several other of the agrarm sites um, and looked at differences in row seeding, row width and seeding rates and the impact on our model weeds were our oats and tame mustard to represent wild oats and wild mustard. So we looked at 10, 12, 14, and 16 inch rows, and this is a neat little cedar that they have there at Indian Head where you can just crank a spool and you can move those rows in and out to whatever width you want. And then they're fed by a Gandhi unit up on the top there to deliver the seed and the fertilizer. We had our base rate of 25 plants per square foot, and we looked at 75% of that seeding rate 100, 150, 200% of that seeding rate. And essentially, if the long and the short of it is that all the other sites that only had two row widths essentially reflected what we saw at the Indian Head site. So I'll just show you what happened at the Indian Head site. So this is essentially a picture of it. This was a demo that was a couple of years before the, the work that we did this past summer. Um, if you look on the right hand side here, here's the check with the tame mustard and the tame oat. This is the two times seeding rate with on 12 inch spacings. This is the half time seeding rate. This is again a different demo, but you can see the weeds up and down through the, the wider rows here at the lower seeding rate. So shorting on seed is not really saving you anything. You're just, you're opening it up for more weed infestation. So you're gonna end up with higher numbers of weeds getting through that and more escapes, producing more progeny and getting ahead of everything. So early season weed biomass. So this is essentially, you're looking at about six weeks after planting. And so this is the biomass of the weeds. Essentially on the left is row spacing all the time. On the right is seeding rate. And if we have, see that P number up on the, the top there, if we have that as 5% or less, then that means it's significant. If it's more than that, it's not significant. So the row spacing is almost significant. And if you look at it from the linear perspective, the P value is less than that, that 0 0.05. So that's a significant result, but there's no significance on the, the seeding rate. So Early season biomass, essentially it reduces the biomass at the narrower row spacing. So at the 10 inch row spacing. For a visual assessment of weeds at the end of the season, again, narrower row spacing, significantly better, uh, lower weed population than wider row spacing. And in this case, also higher seeding rate lower weed infestation levels than the lower seeding rate. Uh, wheat head density within those stands. And this is a bit of a complex curve. So uh, the low seeding or the narrow row spacing is the red diamonds. 
And so that's this line here. And so what we're seeing is that we're at the narrower row spacing, we're getting more of a response to seeding rate changes than we are at the highest or widest row spacing. So essentially, the widest row spacings here are flat, and our narrow row spacings are responding to higher seeding rates as far as um, the head density of wheat. Uh, crop maturity. Uh, narrow row spacings are day, day and a half earlier, and higher seeding rates are day, and, day or day and a half earlier. Not a huge amount, but it's something. Um, and ability of the crop to compete with weeds, essentially what that is, is it's the dockage over the total yield. So the percent of your, um, percent of your sample that's dockage subtracted from 100%. So um, the higher the number, so the narrower your row spacing, the more your crop is able to compete with weeds. Same with higher seeding rate, more able to compete with weeds. And so these numbers are very, very significant here. So they're like well below that 5% that level. Crop yield. Seeding rate, not so much, flat. So from that perspective, mm, from the row spacing perspective, we are getting a yield bump, and a pretty, pretty significant one as well. So we're seeing a benefit of, of narrow rows from the perspective of overall yield, and test weight as well. And so why are we buying seeders with wide rows? for engineering reasons, not for agronomic reasons. It's essentially to allow straw to go between. And now Bourgeois has figured that one out. They've got those little springy bicycle wheel things that go between the rows to clear all the junk between the rows. So why do we need wide rows now? We don't. OK, um, cropping practices. Uh, conventional tillage versus zero till. So zero till is a benefit. And any amount of fertilizer does, is better than no fertilizer as far as managing green foxtail. And the other thing we have is harvest weed seed management. So there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of this stuff going on in Australia. They have a weed in Australia called rigid ryegrass that's resistant to everything. Everything, everything, everything. And it's everywhere. So now they've resorted to having to deal with weeds coming out of the back of the combine, and how do we deal with that to minimize the impact on the field? So one of the things, they're dealing with a great weed spreader. So one of the things that they do is they take the chaff out of the back of the combine. They've got a little plenum in the back of the combine. We'll do this thing. So what they do is they put a little plenum in the back here that separates the straw from the chaff coming off the sieves and directs that chaff into these management systems. So now we've got this thing here splits that chaff up and puts it in the, in the row behind the wheel tracks. This one here, you've got the option of going either way. So it'll run, there's a belt in here that runs that way, or you can reverse it and run that way, depending on which wheel track you want to put it in. But it's just essentially, it's a narrow row between one or the other wheel tracks. And so they're using this in conjunction with control traffic farming. They're running over those lines all the time with their equipment. So the sprayer runs on that line, the combine runs on that line, the seeder runs on that line. And their crop rows will straddle that line. So they won't run a crop row right on that line, but they'll run it on either side of it. What they're finding is that the chaff in those rows ends up composting itself because it'll rain, get wet, and it'll start to rot in there. Every once in a while, especially because Australia is really dry in a lot of cases, they'll get a situation where they have too much chaff build up, they'll have to light a match to it and burn it. Probably not the most desirable, but they do that. They get to the point where they, with their sprayers, they don't have to spray the whole field anymore. All they have to do now is spray a nozzle over top of each one of those tracks to keep the weeds from coming up through that compost. The rest of the field is clean because they've collected all those seeds off for so many years and directed them into those narrow rows that now they don't have to worry about spraying the field. So that's a plus.
they save a lot of money that way. Another process is called the uh, cage mill, and that's what this thing is here, is a little model of a cage mill. So essentially what a cage mill is, is that um, Ray Harrington, this inventive farmer from Australia, um, he used to work in the mines, and what they had is these mills that used to crush up rock. So essentially what you've got is a, you've got, this will be your upper one. So there'll be a hole in the top of this where the seed gets, or the chaff gets fed into the top of this mill. And it'll be stationary, so it'll just sit there like that. Then you've got a unit in the bottom that's driven, and they mesh together like this. So one's yellow and one's red, so you can tell what's going on. That thing underneath there spins at like 3,000 RPM. So all the chaff that goes in here, there's also what will be in the middle of this one, there'll be paddles in there that will force all that seed out into these bars. These bars, a lot of them are coated with tungsten, so they wear really, uh, really well. Um, and essentially what that means is that as they bang off of these bars, alternately through the, the um, static ones and the moving ones, you kill the germ of the seed. And so you end up getting about 95 to 97% kill of the weed seeds going through that system. And there are a few different systems now on the market. When we first started talking about this a couple of years ago, there was only the two. But now we've got four or five on the market that are being developed um, that are out there in the world. So we'll look at some of those and see what's going on. That's the old one that Ray Harrington developed in the first place, and that was just a pull behind. He had to root all that chaff into the mill back here that had a big diesel motor running on it in the back there. And it was another 100 horsepower motor back there running the mill. So um, th things have gotten way more efficient since then. So the one on the left is the integrated Harrington seed destructor. The one on the right is a seed terminator. Roughly the same concept. Essentially what you've got is those horizontal mills like this, where you've got the static one on the top and you've got the one that rotates on the inside, right? The, the Harrington Seed Destructor on the left, it's run by hydraulic motors, and so you have to have a whole bunch of hydraulic cooling paraphernalia on it to make sure that you get rid of all that heat. The Seed Terminator is run by belt off of the straw chopper pulley. So you're just drawing power off the motor from, from that perspective. So you don't have to have all that extra cooling stuff on the outside. Uh, Harrington Seed Destructor has gone a different route now, and um, the old one used to cost about 125,000 Canadian, and it used about 80 to 100 horsepower to draw or to run that thing and it only got about 95% efficiency of kill. So, um, whereas the seed terminator, for that same power draw, they are selling units now for 75,000 US, so roughly 100,000 Canadian um, installed, and they get about 98% uh, kill of, of the, the seeds going through there. Um, the new concept that they've done with the Harrington uh, Seed Destructor is a vertical mill. So instead of them sitting like this, the mill now sits like this. And so this is now your static one, the red one. And then on the inside, you've got this one here whipping around at a bazillion miles an hour. And in that center portion there, there's an, a little auger that runs the seed from the middle out to the, the mills. There's a lot of air rushing through here, so it gets sucked into there pretty easily. Uh, this also works as a stone trap and a, a metal hardware trap. Um, this one here has a magnetic bar in here to catch any metal that goes through the combine and out the other side. I'm not sure what they do to handle rocks. and I'm, I suspect that they don't get handled very well. Um, the new vertical Harrington Seed Destructor is now only 96,000 Canadian. Uses less power, so it uses about 
70 to 90 horsepower and gets 98% kill, like the Sea Terminator. This is what's in the guts of these things. So this is the Harrington Seed Destructor, the horizontal one on the, um, on the inside. So there's our paddles on the inside and our bars. You can see there's three rows of, of the bars on the inside, the impact bars. And you'll have the other bars will run in between here, right? The ones on the bottom set. The Seed Terminator has a little bit different design. They've got on the, the mobile unit, they've got the bars. But on the stationary unit, they've got this meshy type of arrangement. They've gone from this smaller mesh here to this little bit bigger mesh. They've improved their, their energy use and they've uh, maintained their kill uh, at that pace. And what you see here is these are worn out. Like these are worn right through. So that those are used units and so you will wear on these things, so you'll wear them out and you'll have to fix them. So um, that, all that use, they figure is about $7 an acre. Depreciation, wear and tear, extra um, fuel use, slowing down harvest, and depreciation on the original purchase is about seven bucks an acre is what they figure. Now we've got a Canadian entry into that market, which is the Redicop seed control unit, and it always comes integrated with the MAV straw chopper. Um, right now, all they have is uh, the ability to put them on John Deere combines. They have to, I think they have to be an S type or above. Um, generally, these things fit on class seven and up combines and the old, they're harder to retrofit to older combines and lower horsepower combines. Um, this is a dealer order, so when you buy a new combine, you order this as an option and the dealer adds it on and away you go. You can disconnect uh, the unit down here so that you don't do the chaff. Um, it's pretty straightforward. You pull that little panel off, you pull a spline out and you're done. This one is also about $75,000 US unit plus the cost the added on. Um, and it works kind of like a hybrid. We'll see the guts of it in a second. Kind of a hybrid between the Harrington Seed Destructor and the uh, Seed Terminator. This is a new one that's being developed in the US by Tech Farm. And it's a little bit different design. It's meant to be lower horsepower requirement uh, be lower cost, we're looking at 56,000 to, to buy it in the first place. Uses only about 50 horsepower, so way lower energy use. But the cost of that is it only gets 80% seed kill. So you're looking at, at some compromises there. Um, so the, the insides of these things, here's the, uh, the uh, seed control unit. Again, there's the paddles very similar to the seed destructor on the mobile component. Uh, but it has bars all through like the Harrington Seed Destructor. The big advantage that Redicop is selling on these is that these um, bar units, the stationary units, you can flip them over. You can reverse them so you get wear on both sides. So they're expecting that's going to double their, your wear. All these things are, are coated in tungsten so that they're super hard and wear a long time anyway. And then this one here has a combination of these flails that are kind of moving around and moving against one another. So essentially these will move in and out between one another and you end up getting the impact in there. But because you're getting better flow of material through there, you're um, saving on energy costs. And that's what it looks like coming out the other side. Volunteer canola spiked into chaff. Um, this was all done by Brian Tideman at uh, uh, Lacombe, Egg Canada Lacombe. And this is what it looks like if you went through the Harrington Seed Destructor and came out the other side and planted all that stuff. Challenges, you have to actually get the seed in the combine for it to be controlled. And one of the challenges we have, what's our big weed resistance problem that I just talked about here? Wild oats. What happens to wild oats? They shatter. So only about 60% of the wild oats actually get into these things in the first place. The rest of that seed laying on the ground by the time you go over. 
You can increase that number a little bit by swathing, but only a little bit. You'd have to go really, really early otherwise to, to get them that way. But 60% is better than nothing. The other option for wild oats is something like this that they use in France, and that's just clipping stuff uh, above the crop. So that's another option to deal with wild oats above the crop. Um, Borgo has a system that's a 50 foot wide unit that's a pull behind unit with 1,000 PTO and can cut from four inches all the way up to 45 inches in height. So you can go over any height the crop, clip the, the flowers off the top of wild oats and fix them that way. So that is another option. There's another version in France that they use that will clip these things off and then collect the tops and move them into a hopper bin that follows behind the, the clipping unit. And then you dump everything outside of the, the field. The leelopathy is another option. So if you're fallowing, maybe you sweet clover in, in the fallow year instead of just leaving it bare. You're going to use a little bit of um, moisture, but you're going to get nitrogen in return, and you're going to suppress weeds. So this is the kind of suppression that you can see with dandelion the following year, um, with flixweed, with kochia. So this is all from the residues that are sitting in the soil of that, that hay crop. So what was I preaching to in this presentation? Organic farmers. So we can borrow some of the tools that organic farmers have available to them in order to manage our weeds as well. So we tend to be very, very fond of uh, mixing things in the same tank as far as herbicide school. So herbicide layering is essentially another way to get multiple modes of action without having to mix them in the same tank. So essentially you're putting on a soil active product and then you're following up with an in-crop application in multiple groups. You can get an improvement in weed control that results in better yield at the end of the day and you're also battling resistance. Um, and so here's some work that was done at the University of Saskatchewan on mixing glyphosate, quinclorac, and clomazone, which is command, um, in the tank at the, either two-way mixes or a three-way mix overall. And so you can see that we get, with the mixes, we get very, very good uh, control out here. These letters here, if they're the same, that means that they're not significantly different statistically. If they're different, it means that that, that difference is real. So these may look a little bit different, but they're not. These may look a little, little different, but they're not really within the realm of error that's in the field or variability that's in the field. So that's something to kind of keep track of when we look at up here. So this is cleavers biomass. And so we're getting good control of cleavers. And this is contamination in the seed lot. And essentially, that's one of the biggest challenge for crushers is, is cleavers contamination in the seed. And it's because it scores their rollers that they use to crush the canola with. So they don't want cleavers contamination in their canola. And what's the best there? We're looking at the three-way or the two-way mix with uh, quinclorac. And oh, by the way, they did this also with Liberty and with the, the Clearfield canola and got roughly the same kind of results. So I'm just gonna show the glyphosate here. And the other part is the yield. And what we're seeing here is that with the mixes, we're getting better yield than we would with the products alone. This one's pretty much the same, but when we get to the three-way mix, we're getting significantly more yield as a result as well. Um, folks in the room that have gray hair like me may have remembered when Monsanto had their uh, Avidex yield challenges back in the day. Um, this is the information that they were looking at. So one thing about soil active herbicides is that they're controlling the weeds before they, the crop comes up. And so what that does, that gives you a yield advantage as a result of that. And the weed control doesn't have to be perfect for that advantage to, to be there. So if we convert that to dollars per acre, if you're waiting to spray your weeds until you get to the six leaf stage, you're losing 140 bucks an acre. 
I think that's pretty clear cut. So herbicide layering can contribute even if the, the herbicide isn't really doing much on its own. So if you go back here, clomazone is really not doing that well on its own. But when you get it in a mix, it's contributing quite well. So it doesn't have to be 100% control to uh, provide some uh, contribution, especially to resistance management. Um, you want to make sure you get ahead of the problem before you start using these products, otherwise you're not going to get the benefit of multiple modes of action working for you at the same time. Um, if we wait, we might be in the same situation as the producers in Europe are in. They've got a plant called blackgrass there that they have to apply six different active ingredients to that field in order to get suppression at $120 plus an acre. We don't want to go there. We're almost there now with wild oats. Kosha, everybody gets wound up about kosha. <laughs> kosha, no problem. Wild oats is the one you got to worry about. And wild mustard. So those are the ones that are going to be the big problem. Challenges to integrated management that I talked about. One of the things that's going on now is that all these urease inhibitors and things that prevent volatility of, of nitrogen when it goes on, they're giving people more confidence, and Mike talked about this, they're giving people more confidence that they can get away with do, not doing the right thing as far as the fertilizer applications. And consistent with what Mike was talking about, some work done by Kirkland and Becky back in 1998, they looked at broadcasting versus fall banding versus side banding. And this is the biomass that they found in spring wheat, as, just as a result of the fertilizer management. So manage your fertilizer properly, you'll manage your weeds well as well. And there's been, with some of those wet years, there's been heavy promotion of the, those tillage implements that you can be a race car driver and a tiller at the same time. So you made the investments during the wet years and there's this inclination to want to take advantage of that investment. So you want to now use it all the time. And that's not working to your advantage based on that slide I showed on the benefits of direct seeding on your weed control. Once you work wild oats into that layer, they're going to grow better and last longer in the soil. Uh, commodity prices haven't been our friend as far as having a diverse rotation, so that's been a challenge. And we now have commodity organizations that are kind of competing for clients, so to speak. And so they're promoting their, their spate of crops above others and not really looking at the whole rotation in some cases. So that goes on as well. Um, but I think integrated solutions are the way we have to go if we want to keep the tools that we have in our toolbox right now. If we keep going towards that wall, we're going to run into it. And then we're either all going to be cattle producers or organic producers. 